And what we encounter in Christianity, it bears no relationship to what the Messiah is supposed to do as per Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. It's really that simple. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Gray Area Podcast, where I have the conversations people are afraid to have with people they're afraid of. And this conversation is very important, uh, in my opinion, because there's a lot of conversations going on uh, as of a, a, as of late about Judaism, Jews, secular Judaism, what do Jews believe? And a lot of people don't understand. And I'm following these conversations, and I, and, and, and I study... Uh, a lot about what Judaism is, and I study, just like I study a little bit about what Islam is, because you have to know what people believe, because too many people have conversations of their ignorance and what they're speaking about. And I've seen a lot of that uh, regard, <laughs> regarding this issue. And then I've seen a few people talk to people that are secular Jews or Israelis, but not, but not Jewish. And it's like they're getting information from these people, and they think that's the, you know, they think that that's the uh, that's the that's the ultimate truth. And I was watching uh, one of my guest videos, and he had talked to a lady um, who had brought up how she got information from a secular Jew that they were there that Jews were afraid to talk about something, and he sort of laughed and just instantly went into scripture. So, uh, welcome Rabbi Tobia Singer to the podcast. Thank you for having me. For the people watching. Me, me and Rabbi Singer, we've talked multiple times before. Um, I never invited him on the podcast, but I thought I didn't think he was gonna come on because he's a very busy guy, seems like. So, so thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me on. I don't know how you want to do it. You want to start off with the bigger questions people have? No, I'm gonna start off with this because it seems so simple. I know to you, this is gonna seem very simple, but a lot of people do not even understand this. I had to try to explain it to somebody. Um, on a on a very large podcast, actually. What is a Jew? So we're a unique people. We're the the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we're a nation, but we're the only group in the world that's also an ethno religious group, which means not only are we the descendants of the patriarchs and matriarchs, but also we have a faith now. Not all Jews are loyal to Hashem. Bernie Madoff, he's not one of them, and neither was Karl Marx. But there are Jewish people who are loyal to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that's the Jewish faith. And God made a covenant with our people. He called upon us to be a light to the nations, and our role is to be loyal to the Torah, to God's commandments, his law, and to have a personal relationship with God based on the Torah. We have a promise that we would return back to our homeland and a promise that there will be an ingathering of the exiles and the coming of a Messiah at the end of days. We are radically monotheistic, which means we believe in one God and one God alone. Nothing created by God is worthy of worship. Moreover, most people don't understand why the monotheism is so important. And people think it's just a math issue. It's just like we believe in one God. But why is that so critical? A Jew has to be ready to die rather than worship idols. Because if God is one and only one, then we know a lot about his nature. He must be filled with love and grace and mercy. Because after all, there's nothing you have or I have that God needs. He's omniscient, omnipotent. He's all-powerful, all-knowing. And therefore, if God created this world, he did it only as an act of altruistic love. And therefore, we know the God to whom we bow, to whom we kneel, to whom we worship, and him alone. And that's, what, that's the message of Judaism, and that's the, that is the, uh, the role, the mandate of the people of Israel. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong here, but biblically speaking, if I'm not mistaken, um, that the word Jew comes from the tribe of Judah, which is uh, which was the southern kingdom, which was the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, and, and, and some of the tribe of, of Levi. And then you had the northern kingdom, who was called the tribes of Israel, which were the rest of the 12 tribes, including also 
uh, the tribe of Levi. And um, the the reason that the word Jew is used as a blanket term is because uh, when the Assyrians uh, did their conquests and pretty much attempted to annihilate uh, everyone from the northern kingdom and then everybody got scattered. So all that was truly left was the tribe of Judah, which is, you know, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. That is that pretty accurate? It's very accurate. I just, I'm going to roll one piece into this. Absolutely correct. Just to to reiterate that, uh, during the Assyrian Empire, the northern kingdom of Israel was carried off, and those are called the Ten Lost Tribes. And the southern kingdom, which was headed by Judah, by the Davidic king, in that case, Hezekiah, a very righteous man. So the Davidic dynasty and the kingdom of Judah was preserved, and the children of Israel who were loyal to the southern kingdom were called after Judah. Now, this wasn't just a convenient issue. It really relates to a prophecy in that when Jacob was on his deathbed in Genesis 48, 49, the end of the book of Genesis, each tribe was given a blessing. And Jacob said in chapter 49, verse 8, that all your brothers will praise you, which is always meant to understand that all the tribes will one day be called after the Jews, even if they're not from the tribe of Judah. Let me give you an example. Uh, Mordechai from the book of Esther he was a Benjamin. He was from the tribe of Benjamin, but he's called an Ish Yehudi, a Jew. The Hebrew language in the Bible is called the language of the Jews. It wasn't just a convenient issue. It's part of a larger prophecy in that Judah would be the lead tribe. Out of him would come forth, of course, the Davidic dynasty, but all the other tribes will be subordinate to him in that the nation will be known as the Jewish nation. And as you said, of course, when the 10 northern tribes are carried off, everyone who was loyal to the south would have that description. Thank you so much for that explanation. Uh, also, I got to ask this question because I think a lot of people will be shocked by your answer. Um, I, I've watched you talk about, talk about this before. You know, a lot of people have this thing where black people can be Jews and, you know, a lot of people there's an argument about that, but I've watched you talk about the, um, I think you were talking about, please correct me if I'm wrong, the, the Jews in Ethiopia had the same bloodline origin that, that you would have, correct? In, in Israel, there are many, 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 many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Jewish people that are black. I mean, this country has is filled with uh, you know, Jewish people that come in all colors. Many rabbis, one of the some of the great rabbis in this country are, are, are great men who are who are black. So here it's it's not in America. I don't know how big it is, but here it is. Yeah, and the Ethiopian Jews, the tradition is they come from the tribe of Dan. But regardless, yeah. But 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 yeah, you saying they had they come from the one of the twelve tribes. I just thought that'd be interesting because a lot of people think that. Um, Orthodox Jews think that no black person can be a Jew at all or from the tribe of Israel at all by blood. Oh, no. Yeah, we have we have many rabbis, many leaders of communities that are black here in the Holy Land. I'll just say this. I'm not an expert on this because I haven't lived in the United States for a very long time. But in America, there is a sense from outside that there that racial tensions is something that is that's a big deal. Here it isn't. People I don't think people really notice that at all. There are other issues that we contend with, but not not black, white. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to get to a lot of questions that uh, a lot of people have. Some of them I find it uh, funny because I already know how you're going to answer them because I watch I watch videos. And uh, as you know, me, you've talked before, I am, I do consider myself a Christian, but I'm not like modern Christians, I don't think. Uh, well, I know I'm not. <laughs> but um, so I'm going to ask a question that a lot of people are asking, even though I've heard you answer before, then I'm going to ask a question that I have now. So the question, one of the questions I got is why are you, I know you already know you heard this before. Why are Jews so afraid to read Isaiah 53? They say they've talked to Jewish people and they do not ever read Isaiah 53. They don't preach it in the temples. It is something that, uh, Jews are afraid to speak about, which is Isaiah 53. What is your thoughts on that? So from the Jewish perspective, it's quite the reverse. We find that it is, please, no one take this personally, but generally speaking, we find that Christians are afraid to read anything but Isaiah 53. 
and what ha- and Jews are somehow we we study the whole book of Isaiah, all sixty six chapters. And as it turns out, when I'm on the street and I'm talking to a Christian, and I ask him, like, what does it say in Isaiah fifty two, Isaiah fifty four? No idea. So it's, it's from the Jewish perspective. I know it's reversed. It's it's specifically the entire book of Isaiah that we love. We read it in the original Hebrew, and it seems that Christians have have selective reading. They know this passage in Isaiah 7, that passage in Isaiah 9, that passage in Isaiah 53, and nothing else. One other point should be mentioned. And then we're this, it's a scam. It's a scam that Jews don't read the Isaiah 53 in the Haftorah. So I need to just explain this to viewers or no one will get what this whole shell game is about. It's three card Monty, but it needs to be explained. In the synagogue on Sabbath, we not only read from a portion of the Torah, which means the five books of Moses, but we also read from a portion of the prophets. But when it comes to the prophets, we only read a very small segment, only about 3% of the prophetic part of the Hebrew Bible is read on the Sabbath, which means the vast majority is not read, including Isaiah 53. Now, what some Christians suggest is that the Jews, we just somehow are afraid of Isaiah 53 because it's not read in the Haftorah. That Haftorah, incidentally, you could see is in the Christian Bible, where we are told that Jesus in the book of Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 18, in a synagogue in Nazareth on the Sabbath, read from the book of Isaiah. So you see this tradition, which started during the time of Hanukkah, about 2,200 years ago, is in the Christian Bible itself. But the point is, we don't read Isaiah 63. We don't read Isaiah 13, right? So what happens is those who are seeking to attack the Jewish faith peddle in the idea that we just somehow just leave out 53. And for us, we're going like, why don't you guys look it up for yourself? Like, why don't you check it out? How much of the of the prophets do we read, and do we just leave that out? And what someone would discover very quickly is the vast majority of the Hebrew Bible we don't read enough Torah. Isaiah fifty three has nothing to do with any portion of the Torah, and that's why we don't read it. But what is done, unfortunately, by some Christians, not all. This is just people who get the stuff from from their pastor Google. You know, if you get your information on Pastor Google, you're in a lot of trouble, just the way it is. So what happens is is that people read this on the internet and then they repeat it, they regurgitate it because it fits into their into their worldview, into their 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 the way and they say, ah, the Jews are into some sort of conspiracy where we're hiding a passage of the Bible. In fact, Jews Jews don't do that. It's quite the reverse. We read all of the book of Isaiah not just Isaiah 7, 9, and 53. When I watched the video of you responding to the lady, <laughs> I found it found that you started like quoting some of Isaiah 53 in Hebrew. Like, I know mm-hmm. Isaiah 53. Trust me, we don't we don't hide from it. And right. I found uh, and, and I felt like she was sort of shocked. Um like like uh, like, matter of fact, can you quote a part of Isaiah 53 right now in Hebrew? I just want to, you know. Sure. Me Hemin Lishmu Senu Uzraya Shem Ami Nigoso. That's Isaiah 53, verse 1. Like, who would have believed their report? And look to whom the arm of the Lord is revealed. It's Christians are good people. I'm not patronizing them. But what's happening is they're not taught the Bible in its original language. And therefore, they are reliant. They are enslaved by the translator. That's really the deal. The deal is that Christian schools can each easily teach their students the language that God used to communicate to the prophets. Hebrew, biblical Hebrew is an easy language, simple, concise, small, 8,800 words. That's the whole biblical Hebrew. They could do it. They don't. So therefore, every Christian has to use a Zen IV or King James Version, and they fight over which is the better one. And just going, are you insane? Like, why don't you want to read the original language? Moreover, God created the world through the Hebrew language, Psalm 33, verse 6. Like, why would you want to be kissing God through a towel? Every translation is a commentary. Like, what would go through your mind to rely on 47 men in England during the 17th century who rendered the Bible into the English language, into Jacobian English? Like, why don't you just 
teach your kids Hebrew. It's, it's so logical, but yet Christians don't do that. There are hundreds, there are thousands of Christian schools in America, thousands. None of them teach children Hebrew. They teach them Latin, Spanish, French. Great. Why not Hebrew if they believe that Hebrew is the holy language? And they do. So, you know, for, this, look, this is my native language, Hebrew. It's not, you know, it, it, this is simple for Jewish kids because we teach our children Hebrew. I mean, this, these are, this is the first native language. Yeah, I, I'm currently in the process of trying to learn Hebrew. Like, I, I know words. I don't know how to, like, pronounce them properly. But, I mean, when you study when you study the Bible, you sort of have to go back to the Hebrew language or the New Testament. You sort of have to go back to the Greek um, because sometimes the translator is sort of trying to, like, add a little something to it that wasn't necessarily there. Another one of my questions is I have these conversations all the time all the time with, with Christians about keeping the commandments because I, I think you you know this but I, I try to keep I keep the commandments um the ones we can't keep because there's no temples and things things of that nature uh but and one of the things I use I always ask people like did God change his mind because in numbers I believe it says God 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 does not change and then and, and the verse I bring up is Deuteronomy 29 the last verse in Deuteronomy 29 uh, it says uh, the Torah is for us and our children to observe forever, right. ever. And so my question is, am I confused about that? Is, is the word actually forever? You know, does it actually mean everlasting or what's happening there? The secret things belong to the Lord our God. And that which has been revealed belongs to us and to our children. Forever, laasos es kol divrei hatayr hazois, so that we may we may fulfill, keep all the words of this law. It's like really, it's right there. Look, the Bible could not have been written just for people with high IQs. I mean, salvation has to be accessible to everyone. If you have doctrines that are so complicated that you need a master's degree in theology in order to understand it, then then that's not the Word of God. The, the thing about the Torah is that anyone can understand it. Little kids can understand the stories in the book of Genesis. They may not understand every – maybe questions people have, but this, the Torah is written in a way that anyone can understand. I mean, it's such simple language. So the answer is the Torah is forever. Now – it doesn't apply to all people at all times. Uh, just as an example, there are laws in the United States that apply to if you can't see very well. If you have poor vision and you want to operate a motor vehicle, you got to be wearing your glasses, right? You, you can't, right? Now, let's say you have perfect 2020 vision, okay? So there's a law in the books to operate a motor vehicle. And you have whatever, whatever, just bad vision, okay? So you can't do that, right? So that law doesn't apply to you. It doesn't mean you don't believe in it or fulfill it. It just doesn't apply to you. You have 20-20 vision. So there are laws that apply to men that don't apply to women and, and vice versa. There are laws that apply to a thief. A thief has to return something you stole. If you didn't steal anything, you can't fulfill the myth of returning that which has been stolen, right? So, yes, so we all the Torah is our life. Look, the, the Torah, the law is what gives us life. It makes Torah Hashem Tamima. Let me talk, let's talk the language of God. Torah Hashem Tamima, the Torah of God is perfect. Mishivas Nofesh, it restores the soul. Edus Hashem Ne'amona, the testimony of God is trustworthy. Machimas Pesi, it makes the foolish one wise. Psalm 19. Don't you want to fall in love with God? It's gorgeous. I mean, of course it's simple. Yeah, I have some people, um, James too. James called the law of God perfect, but people... You know, they have all kinds of ways around that. So I, I do want to ask one more question for me before I get, because I do want to go back to Genesis. Um, and it's a question that every, a, a lot of people have. But um, Daniel 7, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel 7 is a prophecy. And to me, it seems like an end times prophecy in the way I view it, because I'm a Christian. I believe in Revelation. I believe in Matthew 24. I view it as a prophecy of what I would call, you know, the Antichrist of some sort. Um, but in Daniel 7, even the way to view it from a Orthodox Jewish perspective, I, I, I sort of want to get to Daniel 7, 25, because it seems like it's saying the beast or the, you know, yeah, I, I think it says beast, even in the Hebrew, the beast will be arrogant 
an attempt to change God's time and mm. his law. And I wonder how is that? Because I don't think I've heard you speak about this specific thing either on your channel. Daniel 7 is just one of the most ecstatic chapters in all of the Bible. And apparently the writers of the New Testament thought so because one of those passages is quoted more frequently in the Christian Bible than just about any other. Um, well, let's think about what institution changed the times and the laws, altered it. There's, it's the final kingdom, the one that blasphemes God. There are four kingdoms that are enemies of God and sought to, and subjugated the Jewish people. The, we know about Babylon, Persia, Greece. We lived under all three of those, but then there's Rome, the fourth Edom, the worst of all. Edom is Asaph. And in fact, we have entire books in the Bible devoted to telling us about the destruction of this morphic nation that would subjugate our people, the nation of Israel. And here's what happens. What would Christendom seek to do? Change the times, meaning Jewish festivals no longer. Uh, when we celebrate, even when Easter is celebrated. You know, at the Council of Nicaea in 325, the church changed Easter from celebrating on Passover to celebrating on a time that is connected to the vernal equinox. How, how did you change that? And the laws. You don't have to keep the laws any longer. Now, I want to be very careful with this. Christians do not teach that you can murder or, or steal or commit adultery. I, I'm not, I'm talking about that, I'm talking about ritual law, meaning antinomian, don't have to keep the ritual law. Let no one tell you about keeping the Sabbath, the holidays, what you eat, what you drink, because this is Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, because the law is only a shadow and the essence is Christ. Right? So it's very important, Hebrews 10, verse 1. Now, if you're a Christian, I hope I don't offend you, but I'm just giving this straight here. So what we have is that final empire, that final nation that would subjugate the Jewish people. Two things they would do. They would change the times, abandon the Jewish calendar. That's what happened in Nicaea. And number two is abandon the Torah means that you don't have to keep the law anymore. Christ fulfilled the law for you. Now, there are Christians, I should say, who don't believe that, because I don't want your viewers to misunderstand this. There are Christians that believe that the laws of the Torah must be kept by every Christian. That's an outlier. The vast majority of Christians would say, you're not under the old covenant anymore. You're not under the, no, we're under a new covenant. You don't have to keep any laws. So I want to be clear, because I don't want you, the viewer, to misunderstand what I'm saying here. So this is Christendom, what the church did, what Rome did. And of course, it's something that we reject, but this is the final enemy. For those who don't know, I just want to just quickly, I, Daniel chapter 7 outlines all the four kingdoms. So this is very much in context. You have the four kingdoms represented by the lion, by the bear, by the leopard, four heads, that's Greece, of course, and then finally the last kingdom with the ten horns and the little horn. That's what Daniel 7 is about. And then the Messiah comes, one like a son of man comes at the end of days, to, comes with the clouds of heaven to the ancient of days. That's the Messiah and so on. And then Daniel now is revisiting that very last kingdom, which Daniel's asking the angel, what is that? So Daniel is most troubled, not by the first three, but by that last one. What is that? That's what troubled Daniel so. So I want to make sure we're reading the, this chapter in context and what's happening here in this section of one of the most ecstatic, numinous chapters in all of the Hebrew Bible. I am one of those Christians that believe we should keep the commandments. Uh, me personally, because of 2 Peter 3.16, I think a lot of people are taking Paul out of context, but you know, that, that's that that's a longer conversation. But I do want to, also before Genesis, because you said something about Old Covenant and New Covenants. And I, I try to tell multiple people this. There, there are multiple covenants even in the Tanakh, but covenants don't just get rid of old covenants or covenants that came before it. it, it am I mistaken in how I'm viewing that? Right. So you believe, I, I, we've never had this conversation straight out, so I'm going to guess, and if I'm wrong, just stop me. You believe there are different dispensations, which means different epochs where God interacted in terms of salvation. So there's an, 
John Nelson Darby saw this as seven different epics. But it do, here's what's key for you, and you probably do this better than I can, is that you don't believe that anything that we find in the New Testament cancels out anything in the Hebrew Bible. The, all the laws of the Torah are permanent, and I'm assuming we don't we didn't have this conversation that you would cite the Sermon of the Mount, meaning Matthew five seventeen. That's yes. right. So there you go. How do I know that? Well, I know that. So I'm, I'm just guessing. <laughs> uh, praise the Lord. Okay. So it's not that I'm mind reading, but uh, you look at these passages like Matthew five seventeen. It's very important because that's the Sermon of the Mount where Jesus, we are told, says that he didn't come to change. Don't think that I've come to change the law, but to fill it. And anyone who changes one jot to the law be considered least in the kingdom of heaven unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes. Then do Christians struggle with it? You better believe they do because they don't know what to do with other passages, in, you know, like Colossians and Hebrews 10 and so on. But absolutely, Christian scholars fight over this a lot, and there's reason for it. Even when Matthew 5, 7 said, literally I was having this debate last night <clears throat> because nobody can answer the question. And it's because right before he says, not one dollar title, it says, until heaven and earth pass. And it's, it's, it's a verse I've talked to scholars, I've talked to anybody, nobody can answer it. Uh, one try to say heaven and earth pass, but even when Jesus rose on the third day, and you, I, I understand that you know the New Testament scriptures too, Jesus still tells you heaven and earth has to pass, and in Revelation 21 it actually passed. So no Christian, modern Christian that I've talked to can can actually truly answer the question of the Sermon on the yeah. Mount. And, I, and I, I, I know it like verbatim by heart. I know a lot of scriptures by heart. Obviously not as much as you because you got years on me. Um, but so... Can may I, for a moment, I apologize. Ahead, Just, I need to make this statement or else people are going to be very confused. A claim that's fantastic requires fantastic evidence, okay? I've never talked this way because I am, people normally ask me about Christianity, which I am typically, I'm very critical of. But here I'm going to, I need to make this point. When Christians are asserting that you don't have to keep the law any longer. You know how fantastic that claim is? You need fantastic evidence for a claim like that. And what Christians then come up with is stuff, not all Christians, I'm thinking those who are antinomian, they come up with with inferences that are very strange, that are very odd. You need very clear passages. So it's very clear what's happening in the Sermon on the Mount, okay? Jesus, we are told, is saying that the law cannot pass away, never pass. Don't even think it for a moment, okay? If you want to upend that, you can't start going with, you know, heaven and earth pass away. You can't use, the bar is very high, very high. And that's how you get involved in a cult. What cults do is they subvert the plain meaning of the text in favor of some very, some inference that's, and that's how all the cults operate. So I would just submit to people that regardless of whether you're Jewish or Christian or Muslim, you have to use a basic rule of hermeneutics, and then you won't get in trouble. There are passages in the Bible, I'm just using that word, in the Bible, that are very easy to understand. We know exactly what it's talking about. When the Bible says, don't eat pork, we know what that means, okay? Now, if you if you have other passages in the Bible that are not clear, that are in the dark, are a little nebulous, what exactly is meant there? So here's the rule. The rule of hermeneutics is we always use passages that are in the light to interpret passages that are in the dark, not the other way around. And the way people get themselves in trouble is they use these inferences to prove the Trinity, as an example. The Trinity, do you know how much evidence you need to prove the doctrine of the Trinity, the hypostatic union? That requires a very, you can't just go, well, Tom said, my Lord, my God. That's not enough. You can't use a fake passage from 1 John 5, 7. You can't use the Great Commission of Matthew 28. You need mind-blowing evidence. So again, the according, you have to tweak your evidence according to the claim. The claim is so strong, so clear, you can't use some odd in and that's why people get themselves in trouble. It's not lining up. They're, you're taking a very strong, clear statement that's unambiguous, and you're taking some ambiguous passage to o o overthrow that? Go back home. That's not how things work. You need clear passages in order to make such a strong statement. That should help people. Speaking of that, that's going to be amongst my questions. We're going to go back to that a little bit. 
uh, my Genesis questions. But my my first my first question for Genesis uh, about Genesis because I don't know how Orthodox Jews do this, and I study I study Orthodox Judaism a lot. How how do do you view the world was done in seven days? Do you view it literally? Because I heard somewhere that um, Orthodox Jews don't view it literally because I guess you know how to. The Bible says something like a, a day is a thousand years or something like that. How do y'all view the, the time? Right. Let, let me lay this off. It's really, really simple. The answer is, of course, we take it literally. Of course we do. But there's one caveat, okay? And that is we just don't have access to one piece of information. That is, how long was a day? Now, this is not weird stuff. Let me explain. The first thing God created was what? Light. Vayhi or, and there was light. That's the first day. When was the sun created? On day four. Okay. So what governed darkness and light? Vayhi er, vayhi vok, it was dark, it was light, on the first day. We don't know. The Bible's silent on this. We simply have no access to what that primordial light was. Now, we... Until the 20th century, it was people wondered, why did God create light before anything else? Why didn't he wait to the fourth day? God doesn't need light, but actually, in a sense, he does. Meaning, we know that from the early 20th century from Einstein, that light and time are intimately connected. Without light, you can't have time. When God created light, time is set into motion. And therefore... When we talk about the world being 5,783 years, we're not speaking, we're not discussing, we're not describing uh, from the first day of creation, but from when Adam was created. So Orthodox Jews are creationists, of course, but we just have no access to how long those first six days were. They might have been 24 hours. It, the science doesn't point in that direction, but it's not relevant to us. What is only relevant is when was Adam and Eve created? When was our first parents created. That's it. We just don't know how long those first... It's not a metaphor. It's none of that stuff. It's just... It's very clear that it wasn't the sun that was creating the life for the first four days, so we just don't know. We don't know how long those days were. That's all. Nothing metaphoric about it. All right. Awesome. Um, second question about Genesis is... um. <clears throat> So you have Genesis one twenty six was a which is a modern Christian favorite, but then right after you have Genesis one twenty seven, which for some reason it seems like a lot of Christians don't necessarily quote right. as much. Um, so in Genesis one twenty six it says uh, made in our image, but right. then in, in one twenty seven it says my image. So what, what who is the our right in 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 in, in, in the Orthodox Jew view? Why do we? do this. I'd like to ask, what does the Bible think? I mean, let's just look at the Torah and and, and do it that way. So the, as it turns out in Genesis one we we're not told who God is speaking to when he says, our bitsalmenu. So let's, let's think this through and let's line it up with Scripture. Man is made is composed of two things. We're not only composed of the dust of the earth, the clay of the earth, but we're also the spirit of God is in us. He breathed it in us. The stuff that angels are made of, we're made of. We are the only creation that is binary. So therefore, when God is speaking, he's speaking to who? Who would be have both the clay and the the metaphysical stuff that's divine? Only the angels. And therefore, God is speaking to the angels. Let us make man in our image. Now, how do you know that's true? Because we have three places right in this neighborhood of the Bible where God is saying our means it doesn't end here. We can go a little bit later to Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. I'm going to say that again. Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. Context. Adam and Eve sinned. They have to go outside of the Garden of Eden. And who? A angels. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm going to shut that off. Angels. Angels are told that they have to use swords to prevent, to block, and man from ever coming back 
into the Garden of Eden, lest he'll become like one of us. Hello, right there again. Moreover, there's one other attempt where man might try to achieve divinity, and that's in Genesis chapter 11, verse 7. What is man doing in Genesis 11? He is building the Tower of Babel. For what purpose? He's trying to rise up to heaven to make a name for himself, and God says, let us go down to confound their knowledge. You know what GPS is? It's a triangulation. That's what's happening here in Genesis. We actually have three places, and it's only three places in the Bible. We have that hour, and God is speaking to angels. The point of the hour is that man is not divine, that he's not God, but man is creating the image of God. That's the nature of him. See Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. And therefore, we have a divine spark, whatever that means. Every human being is creating the image of God. There's a, Your dog isn't. You may love your dog, but your dog is not creating the image of God. We have the tension because we're both we ha- we're, we're what animals are made of. Like if you have a dog, you understand them. He wants to he wants to eat. He wants to be safe. He wants to be loved. He wants to be fed. He wants to have babies. It all makes sense to us. But no dog ever believed in God. No creature ever believed in God. Only mankind. So we are therefore binary. We're different than anything else. And therefore, when God comes to man, he says, let us. And it's for that reason that it's for that reason that God doesn't say let us in any other passage. When God's creating fish, he doesn't say let us make fish. doesn't say let us make animals. Let us make the start. Only man is us. If, after all, there are more than one God, if there's a hypostatic union, then why isn't us used other places? Only for man, as I say, trying to let your passages. Also, what I want to ask is, how do you view, which one should I ask first? I guess, I guess Satan, right? Because I think, I think there's a, a big difference between the way Christians and Orthodox Jews view Satan. If I'm not mistaken, right. y'all sort of view him as an employee of God yes. in a way. I know that right. I know that wording is atrocious, but no, yes, it's he perfect. Well, I love it. He does exactly what God intended him to do, and that's to provide free will. Without Satan, we'd have no free will. We would just want to worship God. There would be no virtue. God says, look, it's not my words. God says, before you, I have placed good and evil, life and death. All right. Well, what does that mean, God? put evil, created evil in Isaiah 45 or 7. I, I didn't say it. It's in the Bible. I don't care what translation you use. In the book of Job, where we have the most the most uh, detailed description of Satan, Satan comes to God. Okay, I don't care what Bible you use. Satan comes to God about a man named Job. This is the oldest book in the Bible chronologically. And Satan makes the case, says, there's this fellow named Job, and he has everything, and he's righteous. And perhaps... If he didn't have all that stuff, perhaps he would be loyal to you, and maybe he would curse you. And God says to Satan, okay, this is what you can do, and this is what you can't do. Okay? You can take everything away, but you can't, take, you can't take his life. And what does Satan do? Satan does exactly what God tells him to do. So Satan's job is to cast forth blandishments to seduce, so we have free will. If Satan did not exist, no one would ever want to sin. No one. It would be too obvious to us. It's not that we can sin, but it's like we, I like to cook. So when I'm in the kitchen, I don't stick my hand in a fire. Why? Because I know what the consequences are. Satan is there to seduce, to accuse, but we can resist those blandishments. But Satan is never in rebellion against God. You will find that in Revelation 13. You will find that in some places, but not in the Hebrew Bible. Satan does whatever God tells him to. So, of course, everybody wants to know if uh, Jewish people view Gentiles as less than. Um, And if you wanted to address that, you can. The reason why the Jews are here is to take care of non-Jews. That's our whole purpose. It's not only that we're not not greater than non-Jews. We're here to facilitate the salvation of non-Jews. At the end of days, Zechariah 8.23, if you're a Christian, that's your Bible— it says 10 Gentiles of different languages will grab the knaf Yehudi, the hem of a Jew. 
Yehudi, Jew, it says there. It's a, and they'll say, let us go with you. Kishamanu, for we have heard that God is with you. Hello. The role of the Jew is to be able to relate to the nations of the world about the oneness of God. Heaven forbid that the Jews are going to the non-Jews to learn about God. That's where everyone gets into trouble. The role of the Jew is to be a light to the nations. Isaiah 42, verse 6, a covenant nation, God's servant, and to be an or lagoyim. Isaiah 49, verse 6, the role of the Jew is to do essentially what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did. Now, most Jews, unfortunately, have abandoned that role because they're too busy in Hollywood making movies, because they're too busy in, uh, in Wall Street making money. That, forget that. That's not Judaism. The role of Judaism is to teach Torah and to be a light of nations. That's our entire role. So it's not just that not that the Jews are, Gentiles are not second-class citizens. It's just the opposite. Our whole our raison d'etre, a mandate in the Bible, is to be a kingdom of priests. Mamleches Khan v'goy kadosh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. Well, if we're supposed to be priests, who, is our, who are the people we're preaching to? The answer is to the non-Jewish world. We want to raise up the non-Jewish world. And in fact, Isaiah 6, the arise and shine for your light has come. The nations of the world will go by your light. So let's go to the Bible. It's very, very clear. But there is, of course, people who don't like Jews. I know you never heard of such an idea, but there are such people. I know there's a whole new concept that someone who doesn't like a Jew. You go, what? I never heard of such a thing in my whole life. There should be any non-Jew who doesn't like it. But this is new. This is the new news off the press that there is somebody they found an Eskimo who doesn't like Jews. Ah, what could you do? Not ever got. There are people who don't like the Jewish people, and therefore they come up with all these conspiracy theories about the Jews, and that the Jews hate the Gentiles, and we could cheat the Gentiles, and we could lie. Whatever. All this nonsense. All this is to be able to convey uh, something that is opposed by the God of Israel. We're here to facilitate the light to the world. That's the whole purpose. Um, also, just just to clear this up before I get to the question, um, I heard a few people say that uh, Orthodox Jewish people view the Talmud as the word of God and equal to the Torah, and that is not true. Am I correct in saying that? It's, it's a little tricky because it's a very different kind of book. It's more than 70 books. Tom was the largest book of eight. But it is not a book like the Torah. But it provides us critical information about how to understand the Torah. If you speak Hebrew, when you do, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Hebrew itself is a consonant language. The vowels are not there. Now, you see vowels when you look at a printed Bible because that was put in by Mesorites. Like, what vowels go on the letters? How do you pronounce a word? Well, without the oral Torah, we have no idea. Uh, the Torah says you should slaughter an animal in the manner that I have shown you. It doesn't tell us that's Deuteronomy 12:21. The Bible doesn't tell us how to slaughter an animal in the manner I have shown you. I mean, look, in the Christian Bible, when we're told Jesus says the Pharisees sit in the, sit in the seat of Moses, he wasn't joking means the what is the oral Torah is directly from God and how to observe it. So the Talmud is a different kind of book because all the commandments are in the five books of Moses. No one adds a new commandment. But how do we perform them? How do we make tefillin phylacteries? You know, think to yourself, like, how do you even, I'll let you the question. Like, how do you know that the book of Song of Songs is the Word of God. Like, how do you know? Because you said earlier you believe in Tanakh, right? Well, well, how do you know what books are in Tanakh? What is the source? And, uh, historians know how the books of Tanakh came together. You know, Whatever it did, take. but you believe it. It's in the Talmud. The Talmud yeah. lines oh. up the canon. Like the Book of Song of Songs, I selected very carefully. Why? Because it's not even quoted in the Christian Bible. Okay? So it means all Christians believe that the book of Song of Songs, as an example, is the Word of God. Without, with Their only source word is Tractate Bava Basra, 40, page 14 and 15, where the entire canon is laid out, its authorship and everything. So Christians sometimes go, we don't believe in the Talmud, or Talmud is not the Word of God, or it's not like that. What are you talking about? Christians rely completely on the Talmud, on the Oral Torah, to know what books are in the canon, what books are out of the canon. And many books, about 10 books of the Hebrew Bible, are not quoted in the Christian Bible. What's your source for it? It's only the Talmud. I know Christians find that crazy and insane, but I don't blame them because they're taught this 
and then they just believe it that the Talmud. So the Talmud is giving us the details. Torah is saying, follow the prophets. But who are the prophets? Who are not the prophets? What are we, is the book of Maccabees the word of God? Is it not the word of God? Like, how do you know? Like the deuterocanonical books that the Catholic Church believes in, though, why don't you believe in them? Because the Talmud says don't believe in them. It's really, it's really that simple. But to be clear, do you view the Talmud as the word of God? As a holy book. The Talmud contains in it discussions among the sages. Now, you have to understand why this is important. The Torah says that you have to have a court system, Deuteronomy 17, right? And you have to have a lot of judges, and that they're going to vote, right? And you go after the majority, right? So it's not like the Jews invented this idea that there are sages, rabbis, whatever, judges. I mean, my gosh, Exodus 21 and 22. You bring your question to the judges. Well, what are they using? So they can disagree with each other, but ultimately a court has a majority rule. So the Talmud is a, does record the discussions and not only the majority rule, which what we follow, but what was the minority rule? What's the dissension? So the Talmud contains all of that information. So it's very different than the Tanakh, which is in a sense dogmatic, the Talmud records a lot of information that's so helpful to us. Think about this for a moment. The Bible says, let me just give you an, an example. The Bible says that uh, in Deuteronomy 23, that a Moabite can never join the nation of Israel. Very simple, okay? Now, as it turns out, King David had a great grandmother. Her name was Ruth. Who was Ruth? She was a Moabite. How did she produce the King, King David and the Messiah? Well, without the oral Torah, you would not know that Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, is, applies only to men who are Moabites and not women. So Christians, without realizing it, depend completely on the oral tradition of the Jewish people. Now, they're not taught this in Christian school. They're not taught this in church because they don't realize what's happening, but they're utterly relying on the oral tradition of the Jewish people. But because the internet is full of all kinds of silly things, they don't realize that, and unfortunately, Christians are not taught that. But the only way Ruth could become a part of the children of Israel, could be the matriarch, could be the grandmother of the Messiah, is because of the Talmud. Otherwise, she is banned based on Deuteronomy 23. I'm giving you a very simple example so that anyone can understand it. Okay. And now I have I have two more questions, maybe three. But with this question here is obviously, like I said before, I believe Jesus is the Messiah, and I believe in the second coming. Obviously, you don't. Uh, the question that all everybody wants to know, even though I've seen you answer, like I've seen you answer this question so much, I can answer it for you if I had if I had to. Why don't you take um, over? So, <laughs> okay, the should, question that should handle you know, the whole thing. Go ahead. This. <laughs> So I was like, okay, let me ask it. And this was obviously number one. Because a lot here's the thing, the truth is a lot of people um live in, I'm not saying this in a totally negative way, but a lot of people live in bubbles, which means they don't they don't even know the basics of of of, of something else. You know what I'm saying? Even though Judaism seems so tied to Christianity, they, they don't even know the basics really of Judaism. So the, the number one question is, why don't Jews believe in Jesus Christ? I never heard that before. No one ever asked me that. I, <laughs> holy smokes. <laughs> uh, well, the reason is because there's no relationship between what the Messiah is supposed to do in the Hebrew Bible and what Jesus did. It's the opposite. I mean, the role of what does the Bible say about the Messiah? When he comes, he's going the world's going to change dramatically. There's going to be world peace. Nation will not lift up sword against the nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. That's Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, for some reason, is never quoted in the Christian Bible. Why? It's on the Isaiah wall across from the United Nations. It should be there, right? They'll take the swords and turn to, and swords and spears turn to plowshares and pruning hooks. Not there. The ingathering of the exiles, the nation of Israel, return back to the land of Israel. A temple will be built in Jerusalem. Ezekiel 37, verse 26 through 28. The whole, the last nine chapters of Ezekiel are devoted to that. The coming of Elijah the prophet before the great and day of the Lord. That's how the book of Malachi ends. Christians should know that's the, the end of the Bible. Well, the knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers the sea. Isaiah 11, verse 9. Um, the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 14. So all the, the resurrection of the dead, Isaiah 26, verse 19. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. So what happens is that people are just not reading their Hebrew Bible 
And rather, they're, they're more familiar with the Christian Bible, and they're sort of reading the Christian Bible into the Hebrew Bible. And that's where I think people get themselves in trouble. It's not personal. It's just there's no relationship between what Jesus did and what the Messiah is supposed to do. So he's not supposed to go around doing miracles. I'm not saying he won't. He might. For some reason, Tanakh in the Hebrew Bible, there's no mention of him healing blind people, none of this stuff. All that, none of that. So dying for the sins of the world, you know, I'll tell you this. Whether you're very conservative, you believe in capital punishment, you don't believe in it, whatever it is, but I think it's important to, no matter who your audience is, like you really would like that only the bad people who did the deed, they go to jail and they're punished in whatever you think that punishment should be. And I think you want innocent people to be exonerated, right? I mean, that's, I think in any country, that's what we would want. It's so logical. We want justice. Very simple. That means that innocent people don't um, do time for wicked people. That's in the Bible, Ezekiel 18. The, the innocent cannot die for the sins of the wicked. The idea that the Messiah is supposed to die for sins that he never committed but someone else committed, we wouldn't want that. We, in a society that did that, that operated that way, its criminal justice operated that way, we would not respect. Well, God's more merciful than any of us. So, right, the idea of the Messiah is supposed to rise on the third day from the grave, there's nothing like that. When Paul says that, that it says that in Scripture in First, in First Corinthians chapter 15 in the first four passages, and he says, according to the Scripture, well, there is no Scripture. It doesn't exist. This is also quoted at the end of Luke 24, 46. There is no Bible. There's no verse like it. These are phantom verses. So the reason it's not, Jews are not anti-Christian. It is true that Christians have driven us crazy over the years. It's true that some Christians have made our lives miserable, but it isn't personal. It's just we have the Hebrew Bible. We follow it. We look at the very clear text. And then what we encounter in Christianity, it bears no relationship to what the Messiah is supposed to do as per Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. It's really that simple. So my, my, my response to that is, um, but you do agree that just because something is not said um, blatantly in the Torah as far as the Messiah, meaning like you said, it you said he may heal people. It just doesn't say in the Torah. Sure. Um, you agree that the that is possible for the Messiah to do those things, though. For sure, right? of course. It's just obviously not important to the Tanakh. It, it's possible he will. The Torah tells us he'll give hechacha, which means rebuke to the nations. See Zechariah nine verse ten, Isaiah two three and four. It's, it's somehow not there. And in fact, in Luke 4, 16 through 18, the author of Luke interpolated he'll heal the blind. It's not in its corollary passage in Isaiah 61, verse 1. Wait, how did that happen? So, it, no, it's not in there. It doesn't mean he won't do it. And that is it's very clear. The reason why Judaism doesn't accept the Christian Messiah has nothing to do with Jesus performing miracles or the claim that he did. That's not the issue. The point is the emphasis in the Gospels is that he was a, a, a miracle worker, that he died for the sins of the world willingly, and that he rose on the third day. If that's not what the belief in and if you believe in him, you're saved, and if you don't believe in him, you're going to go to hell, Mark 16, 16. I'm not making this up. I'm not setting up a straw man. This is the foundation of all, every iteration of Christianity. Well, we're then going to the Hebrew Bible and going, there's nothing remotely resembling that. Messiah is not supposed to die for anyone's sins. No one could die for anybody's sins. There's no passage about him resurrecting the dead. He might do miracles, but as far as the Hebrew Bible is concerned, that's not important. The Messiah is rather going to rebuke the nations, and as a result, the nations will disarm take their implements of war and turn them into implements of agriculture. And what is going on in Ukraine today and in the Middle East today will come to an end. So, Rabbi Singer, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I would have a million more questions to ask you, but I know you're probably busy and I have a lot of stuff to do. I have to fly out. I've only been home four days. I got to fly back out in two. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you so much. I really did this thank to try to, create some, try to create some understanding of what Judaism is. Um, and try to try to debunk 
or confirm some of the things people believed about Judaism and, and questions they should ask. And I decided to go to a, a, a good source of somebody that is, you are a literal Jewish rabbi in Israel. So, so I think, I think there's no better source than that. So thank you so much. And if possible, I would love to have you on again. I hope that you will visit this land and we will get together in Jerusalem. And we can be here in this very, the eternal city together. I, I really would look forward to that. God bless you. And thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. And I plan, I plan to come out there one of these days. And when I come out there, I will contact you. I look forward to it, brother. God bless you. Thank you so much. Let Nasa Bechef Tzoko Azai Melech Azai Melech Shemu Nikra Ve'acharei Kiklo Tako Levado Im Loch Noa Ve'u Aya Ve'u Ove Ve'u Ove Ve'u